والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ويلكم تو انسبيريشنز another episode in which we will be talking about the greatest man to set foot on earth Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam such a wonderful story such a beautiful biography and such beneficial lessons and wisdoms that we have been taking from his life so i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us benefit from those lessons and from those wisdoms and implement them in our lives so the muslims will get to the high position that allah designed for them i say all praises due to allah we praise him we seek his aid and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge in allah from the evils of ourselves and the evils of our actions whomsoever allah guides none can lead astray and whomsoever allah leaves to go astray none can guide and i bear witness that none has the right to be worshiped but allah alone who has no partners and i bear witness that muhammad is his servant and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam now we have been talking about the life of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you are invited to take part in this by uh, joining us every saturday the first saturday of every calendar month you can join us we will the show will be live so you can call in and you can have something something to say about the show for the rest of the month inshallah we will have recorded episodes so you can send us emails and as i said all, every time you send us an email we do take it seriously and we try our best to benefit from it so please do send your emails your comments are very welcome and we always benefit from them now we came to the stage where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was chased by suraq ibn malik and suraq ibn malik realized he came to the point to realize that there will be no way to get hold of this man because there is a divine aid allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is assisting him allah is taking care of him there is no way to get through to him so he went back to mecca realizing that one day muhammad will have dominance over it muhammad will have control over it he realized that because he saw something other people didn't see he went back to his home and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu bakr and abdullah ibn uraiqit were heading towards al madina now they came across a shepherd someone with some sheep a person with some sheep his name was abu ma'bad now abu ma'bad or abu ma'bad Uh, had some sheep but it was that year was a year of famine it was dry there was no rain the sheep was suffering there was no grass no greenery they could hardly graze the sheep and the sheep could hardly give any milk so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu bakr and abdullah ibn uraiqit came across abu abu ma'bid they asked him for milk do you have milk He said, you know, the sheep are too hungry and too thirsty and too weak to give milk. Or to, to give milk. So we, can't, we don't have anything. So Prophet ﷺ said to him, okay, get me any of the sheep that you have. What about this sheep? It was a very skinny and small sheep. Uh, you could tell that it was suffering from starvation, from lack of water, lack of food, and dry weather. The Prophet ﷺ brought it. and he recited some verses on it and he made dua then it was full with milk so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam milked it in a container and he gave the man to drink abu ma'bid himself the shepherd so he drank because it was his own sheep he drank the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam milked it again and he filled the container he gave it to abu bakr who drank and then he gave it to abdullah ibn uraqat who drank then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam drank he was the last one to drink from it then he filled it again with milk and he gave it to abu ma'bid so abu ma'bid looked at him and he said uh, you know who you, who you are because he saw something he never saw in his life the sheep doesn't have any or and the goats they don't have any milk at all how did the milk come and what kind of person this is because he looks to be he, he sounds or he he seems to be the leader he seems because everybody respects him all those people they look at him with an eye of respect the people his companions and he could tell how wonderful and how nice his manners are because he didn't drink himself he wasn't the first to drink he gave abu ma'bid first 
Then he gave, Abu, he gave Abu Bakr and Abdullah ibn Nuraghi, he gave his companions first, although he seems to be the most distinguished among them. He didn't drink himself, he, he was the last one to drink. So the Abu Ma'bad was taken by those, by the wonderful manners and the great personality of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, you know, I've never seen anybody like you, who are you? May Allah bless you, who are you? The Prophet ﷺ said, you know, would you, uh, would you conceal that if I tell you? He said, yes. He said, I am Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. He said, oh, you are the person the people of Quraysh claim to be a sorcerer, or claim to be a poet, or claim to be a liar. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ ذلك. They truly say this about me. But the man was taken by the beautiful character of the Prophet ﷺ, and he saw a miracle in front of his eyes, with his own eyes he saw it. So, and he saw the Prophet ﷺ didn't drink, First, he gave them all, then he, drank, he was the last one to drink. He realized that those are not the manners of a liar. Those are not the manners of a magician or a sorcerer, no. These are the manners of a prophet. So he said, you are the person the people of Quraysh claim to be a liar? He said, they truly say that, the Prophet ﷺ said, with all humbleness. The man said, I bear witness that you are a prophet from Allah. And I believe in you, I believe that, the, that no, no one has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and I believe you are the Messenger of Allah. Imagine with good manners, you can get through to the, to the hearts of the people, you can reach them. You can touch their hearts with good manners, and this is something we need today. This is something that we are suffering from, because unfortunately, many people, especially the practice, some of the practicing ones, they give a very bad example with the harshness and with the uh, hostile attitude they display to people. This is something that really puts many people off when you approach them with da'wah. The Prophet ﷺ was very gentle, very humble, and he would give people precedence over himself. So when the man saw all of this, he said, May Allah bless you. Who are you? I've never seen anybody like you. So this is a wonderful example from the Prophet ﷺ. And we are to learn from that. So when we speak to people about Islam, we have to speak to them with gentleness. We have to treat them with gentleness. Don't show them hostility. Because many of them don't even know about Islam. What they know about Islam is something that is presented in the media. Lies, distortions, allegations against Islam, which are totally untrue. But it's our obligation, it's our mission, it's our duty to expose those lies and tell the people about the, the reality and the truth about Islam. How can we do that? Show them the manners of Islam. Sometimes you don't need to speak about Islam. Just let the people see the good manners, the wonderful personality of a Muslim. If the people get to see that, then you don't need to talk, to talk too much about Islam. You don't need to tell them about Islam because they would have the idea already when they see it in your behavior. And we all know the saying that actions speak louder than words. So let's do away with too much talking and start acting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ O you who believe, why do you say the things that you do not act upon? كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَن تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ no, Allah hates, Allah detests, Allah abhors too much and so much that you say things and then you do not act upon them. Allah hates that, Allah doesn't like it. And today, and I, I, unfortunately I dare say some of the people in the field of da'wah, they say we will do this and we will do that. And then they say so many things, especially when they set up some kind of da'wah project. They say, we will, it, it seems to be rosy, and we are going to dedicate our time. And we will not have enough sleep, no problem. We will sacrifice everything. But when it comes to reality, you will see a lot of personal issues, a lot of greed, a lot of uh, enmity, and a lot of waste of time and efforts. Why? The Prophet ﷺ wasn't like that. Actions should speak for Islam. So this is a beautiful example, and we saw how this man believed. The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him anything about Islam, he just saw him. 
The man just saw how he behaved and how he acted and how he gave others precedence on himself and how humble he was as a leader. And even though the people, he said to him, the people of Mecca say that you are a liar. He said, they actually, did they, all, they say that? He didn't even deny it. With all humbleness, he said it. So the, when the man saw Islam, he believed. The Prophet didn't have to tell him about how, okay, what Islam is all about. And he didn't tell him about this. He saw the man as he realized this is the truth. And people, by nature, human beings, by nature, are always, you know, they always admire good manners. Good character is something admired by all. So let's, this is why people say, okay, give a good impression. How do you give a good impression? By having or displaying good character. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, upon that, uh, was happy to see Abu Ma'bid embracing Islam and believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Ma'bid said, I believe that you, uh, that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that you are the messenger of Allah and I want to join you. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, not yet. It's not time. He said, but wait, stay here. He has become Muslim, alhamdulillah, already. Stay here and until you hear that we have gain some dominance and some strength, then you can come and join us. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't want his companions or the new Muslims to be persecuted. He didn't want to jeopardize their lives. Yes, you have believed, okay, stay where you are, hold on until we become a power, so we will be able to protect you, we will be able to protect each other, then you can join us and you can show your Islam openly. This was such a wonderful thing from the Prophet ﷺ, and it shows how merciful he was to his followers. Now they greeted and they thanked Abu Ma'bid, and then they left. They left him with the sheep and they uh, went on heading towards Al Madina. Now, Al Madina was called Yathrib, it was known among the Arabs as Yathrib. But as the Prophet ﷺ was heading towards it, he gave it a new name. It became to be called Al Madina, the city. Al Madina. This was a name given to it by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu actually talks about uh, Medina. He says that uh, uh, the Medina always pushes the people who are not good, it pushes them outside of it. The people who don't have goodness in their hearts and who do bad actions, they can't stay in al Medina. by the way. They can't live in Medina for a long time. They feel they have to leave because Al Medina pushes the evil people outside of it. This is a hadith, authentic hadith narrated by Al Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ makes it clear that Al Medina tanfuthu al Khabath. It pushes the evil people outside of it. So it's always a pure city because it's the city of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a new privilege and a new name that is given to it by the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, after, uh, you know, uh, being or after leaving Abu Ma'bid and going to Al Madina, after a short while, they came across two tents. Two tents. There was a woman there. That woman was known to be uh, on the routes b between Mecca and Medina, and travelers would buy from her food, drink, milk, water, meat, uh, and any provision they needed. So the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr and their friend Abdullah ibn Urayqit, when they came across this woman, they asked her for food because they were hungry, they didn't have food. She said, we don't have food. It was a year of famine. We don't have any food. We don't have any milk. The Prophet ﷺ saw at the corner of the tent a very skinny and weak sheep. The Prophet ﷺ said, what about that sheep? Or the, uh, it was a goat. What about that goat? Uh, does it have any milk? The woman laughed and she said to him, well, it's too weak to give any milk. It's too, this sheep, this, it, it, it's too weak even to join the herd or to join the other sheep and go graze with them. We left this why we left it at home. This is why my husband left it at home. It doesn't have milk. It's so weak that it doesn't give anything. So the Prophet ﷺ said, can I just, uh, uh, can I bring it? She said, okay, bring it. The Prophet ﷺ made dua on it and he recited some Quran on it. And then it was full with milk again. Now the woman was surprised. The Prophet ﷺ milked it and he gave her to drink. And she drank from the milk. Then his friends drank, then he drank 
they lost, as he did with Abu Ma'bid. Now this woman was the wife of Abu Ma'bid or Abu Ma'bad. She was the wife of him, Ummu Ma'bad. She was very well known. She was a very strong, physically very strong woman. So she was surprised to see that. But then the Prophet ﷺ, after drinking, he filled the container again with milk, then he gave it to the woman and they left. The woman was puzzled and was su surprised. The Prophet ﷺ and his companions headed again towards al Madinah. This woman was taken by surprise. What kind of person that man was? Then at the end of the day, her husband Abu Ma'bad came back to the house and he saw the milk, the container full with milk. He said to her, where did you get this milk from? Because you don't have any sheep. The, the only sheep that you have or the goat that you have, it, she, it doesn't have any milk. She said, well, something strange happened. A group of people came. There was a blessed man among them. You know, when they walked, he was the, his face was bright. He sounded as their leaders. He, looked, he seemed to be, he, sorry, he seemed to be their leader. And uh, they all spoke to him and looked at him with respect. And they, they all treated him as uh, such, a, wonder, such a, a great man among them. You know, he had a lot of respect among them. And she gave a very beautiful description about him, about his physical appearance, his, phys his physical looks, and about his behavior and about his words. She described him in a very perfect description. It's very, uh, it would take us a long time to try to translate it into English, but it matches the description of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of how his words are nice and beautiful, and he's calm, and he is served by the people around him. They all hold him in high esteem. And uh, uh, she described the way he walked. Such a beautiful description. Now we can go back to the books of Sirah, which talk about this narration. Hopefully the books uh, available in English have this description. So she said to him, this is such a wonderful person, I've never seen anybody like him. He said, he must be Muhammad. He told her the story that I believed in him, and he's a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the Prophet sallallahu was coming to, was approaching al Medina. Now the companions of the Muhajirin who already arrived in al Medina, and along with the Ansar, the people who embraced Islam in al Medina, all of them every day after they heard that the Prophet sallallahu left Mecca, every day they would go to the borders of Medina, waiting for the Prophet sallallahu to come. Right from after they pray Fajr, they would go outside to the south side of Medina, waiting for the Prophet ﷺ to arrive. They would actually mount some of the palm trees and keep waiting and watching, observing whether the Prophet ﷺ has come or not. So they were waiting every day. For days, that happened for days. And on the way, the Prophet ﷺ met a caravan of some of, some of the people of Quraysh. Those people were Muslims. Some Muslims were making some business, they would go to a sham to natural Syria and buy some goods and come and sell them in Mecca. Among them was Az Zubair ibn al Awam. Az Zubair ibn al Awam, uh, he met the Prophet ﷺ on the way and he gave a gift to the Messenger ﷺ and to Abu Bakr that was white clothes, white qamis, white thawb. He gave it to the Prophet ﷺ. He gave one to the Prophet ﷺ and one to Abu Bakr. Now the people of Medina were waiting every day and when it became midday and was extreme heat, they always went back homes because they couldn't bear the heat of the sun. That happened for a few days and one day they were waiting until it was midday, an extremely hot day. The Prophet ﷺ hadn't come yet, they left back and they went home. But there was one of the Jews, and we know that Medina was surrounded by Jews, Jewish tribes who migrated from Asham, from natural Syria, who came to Al-Medina, who came to this area of the Arabian Peninsula, because they found in their books a description of the Prophet ﷺ that he, wa that he would be sent <coughs> in that area, or in that part of the Arabian Peninsula. So they were hoping that the Prophet would be one of them. So this is why they all moved and they left, uh, many of their tribes left Asham, and they left the fertile areas, and they came to uh, reside there around al Medina <coughs> and around Khaybar. So one of the Jews, he was on top of one of their forts, because most of the time they live in closed areas, because they always live in fear. 
and they feel themselves superior and the others are inferior. So they don't want to mix too much with the, uh, with the common people because they consider themselves to be of a higher level. So on one of their forts, one of them was on top of it, doing you know, some of his, looking after his affairs or doing something. And it was midday. So he looked uh, to, the, uh, to one side of the desert and he saw three people coming. So he realized, because he saw the people of Medina for the last few days waiting for somebody, and he heard that they were waiting for a, a prophet coming from Mecca. So when he saw uh, three people coming from, uh, from far, he shouted to all the people of Medina. He said, oh, people of Medina, here is the man that you are waiting for. He is, here is the, uh, you know, the, uh, here is your dignity that you were waiting for, because it seems that the people of Medina spoke uh, so proudly about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he couldn't, you know, hold himself because he saw them all the time waiting for him. But they they missed him now as he is approaching Medina. So the people of Medina went all of them out to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to greet him and to uh, to welcome him to Al Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't go straight to Al Medina. What he did, he went to a small town very close to Medina, to the south of Medina, called the area of Bani Amr ibn Awf. Bani Amr ibn Awf is the area called Quba today, where Masjid Quba is. This is where the Prophet ﷺ headed to. So he didn't go straight to Al Medina. He took to the right and he uh, went to the area of Banu Amr ibn Awf, which is called Quba. And he stayed there for 14 days or 14 nights. He stayed there for 14 nights. Now, why, did he, why didn't he go into al Madinah straight away? Uh, I tried to find in the books of Sirah an explanation for this, but I didn't find so far. But we know that he went to uh, the area of Quba, the area of Amr, Bani Amr ibn Awf, and uh, many of the people of Medina, most of the people of Medina came to welcome the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He stayed there, as I said, for 14 nights. There... He uh, was. He used to pray. He established the masjid, the, which is the mosque of Quba, the first mosque in Islam, the first masjid in Islam was the masjid of Quba, where the Prophet ﷺ, during these fourteen uh, area or the time span of fourteen nights, fourteen days, the Prophet ﷺ established uh, the uh, masjid, and the people of Medina started to come to the Prophet Prophet ﷺ to greet him and welcome him and learn from him and sit with him. Now, one uh, the people one day the people or that the first day the Prophet Prophet ﷺ arrived, the Jews heard about him, so some of them came in order to sniff around for some news. So they found they came close to the Prophet ﷺ and they saw him. Some of them, the people who had knowledge about the Torah and about the, uh, the sacred book, they realized that this was the description of the prophet, of the last prophet, the seal of prophets who, was, who they find. It's the same, matches, his description matches the description found in the Torah. So they felt very jealous because they wanted the prophet to be from among them, but it wasn't from among them because they always looked down at the Arabs. And they, was, and they were very upset and very jealous that the Prophet wasn't one of them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of them went actually there and he was upset. So he went straight back to his home, to his brother. And his brother was looking after his, because he had uh, uh, some agriculture, some crops he used to grow. And he had palm trees and dates. So he was looking after his business so his brother came to him and he, uh, and he said to him may allah destroy the children of qila now qila is the grandmother the uh, you know the the grandmother of all the ansar all the inhabitants all the tribes of al madina al aws and al khazraj they belong to one person one father and one mother their mother the grandmother was uh, her name was qila so he said, Bani Qila. May Allah destroy them and kill them, those people of Al-Madina. You know, they are gathered now around someone who they claim to be a prophet. So there was a servant or a slave that worked 
in this garden and who was looking after the palm trees. He was on top of one of the palm trees. And when he heard this, he was about to fall. Because the news meant a lot, a lot, many things to him. So he came down and he said, because he was a slave of that person, who is the brother of the, uh, of the one who came with the news. He came in to the person who came with the news and he said to him, what did you say, what did you say? Now when his master saw him very interested in that news and he was upset to hear that the Arabs are gathering around a prophet and he matches the description found in the Torah, he punched his slave and he said to him, go back to, do, to, to work. Mind your own business. He was upset with that. So the person being a slave, he said, okay, sorry, sorry. And he went back to do his work. Now this person, when he heard this news, it hit a nerve. Because he was very concerned about this news. Now when, night, when it was night time, <clears throat> he himself had saved some money. So he decided to go to see that prophet. So he sneaked out of the house. He didn't want his master to know about it. He sneaked out of the house and he went to Quba, where the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with some of his companions. He came to him and he could see the signs of slavery and hard work on his face because he was treated very badly by his master, by his, master, by his Jewish master. He came to the Prophet and he said, he brought some food and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, this is some food that I prepared for charity as a sadaqah, I want to give it as a charity. And I heard that uh, you and, compan and your companions really need some help. So this is why I brought it for, uh, to you, so have it. So he gave it to the Prophet wasallam. Then he stood a, a bit away and he was watching, he was observing. The Prophet wasallam gave it to his companions and he said, eat from it. But he didn't touch it because the Prophet wasallam is not allowed to eat from sadaqah. And so are Alul Bayt. The people, the descendants of the family of the Prophet ﷺ are not allowed to eat from sadaqah. So when he saw that, he said, this is one sign. This is one sign is true. Then he went back to his house or to the house of his master. Now who this person was and what did he mean by saying this is the first one, the first sign. This man was called Salman, Salman al-Farisi. He was a slave uh, working for one of the Jews and he has a long story that inshallah in the future soon inshallah we will talk about it because it is a very beautiful and very important story so he came uh, so the Prophet sallallahu stayed in uh, Bani Amr ibn Awf in Quba for 14 uh, nights as I said and uh, the, his companions were with him then after the Fourteen nights, the Prophet ﷺ decided to enter al Medina. Now he said to the people of Medina that I plan to enter Medina. Now the people of Medina, about 500 people uh, came to the Prophet ﷺ to welcome him from the people of al Medina. And they were happy that the, and, uh, the elite actually and the most important people, the noble people of Medina, the Muslims, they came to welcome the Prophet ﷺ and invite, invite him to, his, to, to their own houses just to be their guest. Now how did the people of Medina uh, welcome the Prophet ﷺ and how did he move from the area of Quba to enter al Medina? What happened at that time? This is something inshallah we'll find out about after we have this short break, so stay tuned. Is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. We're still talking about the beautiful event of the seerah 
or uh, in this era of the Prophet ﷺ, the event of Al Hijrah, the migration to Medina, many beautiful lessons, beneficial, and hopefully we will be able to benefit from them. Uh, I will remind you that you will be able to take part in this show by writing to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Again, it is inspirations at huda. Dot TV. Do write to us. Your words of encouragement are very important. They really help us, uh, you know, emphasize and reinforce the good things about the show. And your comments help us, uh, you know, improve the show by adding some things to it and fixing some of the uh, aspects where we went wrong or where we fell short. Uh, we said the Prophet ﷺ remained in Quba for 14 nights. Then he decided to go into al Medina. So the people of Medina sent some of their most noble people who were among the Muslims to welcome the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They came to him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Abu Bakr went and that was at night. They headed to al Medina and they entered al Medina. Now al Medina was in a state of uh, celebration, extreme celebration. That was the best day of Medina ever in history. The best day of Medina. The people of Medina were very happy. Everybody went outside the, their homes. Uh, like women went on top of the houses trying to see the Prophet ﷺ, welcome him. The children were running around, all around uh, Medina saying, Ja'a Rasulullah, Ja'a Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah has come, the Prophet of Allah has come, Muhammad has come. Everybody is happy. Everybody is extremely, you know, uh, in extreme state of happiness. And they are rejoicing and extremely, you know, delighted for the fact that the Prophet ﷺ, who came uh, from Mecca after this journey, now he is in Medina. That was the best privilege they could ever even think of. And they were obviously blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be there. So they were very happy, extremely. Medina, all of it, was in a state of happiness and uh, in a state of... Uh, <clears throat> Tranquility in a state of uh, celebration. Everybody was celebrating that. So Abu Bak uh, the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr uh, came to Al Medina, and when they came, uh, as I said, everybody, people were in the streets waiting for Muhammad وسلم, and people saying to each other, "Where is he? Which one is he?" Because they didn't know whether it was the Prophet وسلم, or, or Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with him. Uh, so the people were very happy about the Prophet ﷺ. Some of the companions narrate to us, like Anas ibn Malik says, uh, that when the Messenger ﷺ came to, uh, or Anas ibn Nadr, he says, when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he said, everything lit in it. It was full with lights. Not necessarily physical lights, but it means that Medina was very happy itself. That was the best day. So, as I said, it's a... Uh, it's a, an atmosphere of celebration. The people were happy. That's the Prophet of Allah subhanahu, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with us, will live with us, will live among us. Such a great privilege. Poor are the people of Mecca who pushed him, uh, who expelled him out of Mecca. So they were extremely happy that the Messenger وسلم, is coming to join them, coming to live with them. They would see him speaking. They would see him walking. Uh, they would see him uh, teaching, uh, giving them the khutbah, they would see him eating, behaving, everything. They wanted to learn from him. They wanted to see how he behaves in all his aspects. They wanted to learn his guidance. They wanted to be, take his example. So they were so privileged that the Messenger وسلم, is coming to Medina. He's going to live with us. He's going to be one of the inhabitants of Medina. Such a great privilege. So the people of Medina went out. The men of Medina were welcoming the Prophet وسلم, Oh Messenger of Allah, welcome. Please come to my house. Please come to my house, just stay in my house, O oh, Messenger of Allah, people were competing all, all, you know, over that, they wanted the Prophet وسلم, to be with them, as I said, women were, were on top of the houses, saying, where is the Prophet وسلم? they want to see him, even the women who never got out of the houses, you know, the Arabs had something beautiful, there was, was something called al mukhabba some women, were, a woman would be called al mukhabba the hidden, this woman would not come, come out of house at all, she would not come out of the house, the sun would not see her, this was called the mukhabba This is why the Prophet ﷺ, when he says about Al Eid, the prayer, the Eid uh, prayer, he said, you know, tell the woman to go out. <coughs> so they witnessed the prayer, and even tell uh, the al mukhabba to come out. The women who don't come out of their houses, period. 
tell them to come uh, to, to join the Eid prayer. So this is something called Al-Mukhabba'a women. Even the women who used to stay at home and not come out of the house, they went out and they went top of the, on top of the houses just to see the Prophet wasallam to get this honor and this privilege to see him and uh, to see the Iman in his face and to learn from him. So this is how happy the people of Medina were. The children were running around. Al-Bara ibn Azib says, when he, he was a very little child, and he says, you know, I was going around with the people of Medina, with the children going around saying, the Messenger of Allah has come. Muhammad has come. Ja'a Rasulullah. Ja'a Muhammad. We're happy jumping all around the place, happy and singing songs. You know, their melodies, the children's melodies, talking about the Prophet ﷺ has come. We're happy with that. And they would say, uh, what, a, what a great neighbor Muhammad will be. And they're happy about this. All of them are rejoicing. Anas ibn al-Nadr himself, he says, I heard the children, you know, screaming and running all around the streets of Medina, saying, Muhammad ﷺ has come, so I wanted to see him. And they said, there he is, there he is, and, go, and I go and want to see him, but I don't see him. I see so many people, I, I can't get through the people to get and see him. So it seems that it was an Eid, a day of Eid for the people of Medina. Everybody was happy, everybody rejoiced at the Prophet ﷺ arriving in Medina. Apart for... Uh, uh, except for some people like Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul. Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul, you know, was due and was meant to be to be appointed the leader of Medina. Now the state of Medina or Yathrib before the arrival of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were always in a, they, they were in a constant state of war. Al Aus and Al Khazraj always fighting against each other. You know, only a few months would pass after a truce, then a new war would begin. Many of their people died in war, in this mutual fight, although they belong to the same grandfather. They are the same family. They are the same tribe. But they were still fighting. And the Jews were igniting and were, you know, increasing uh, this kind of enmity because it really worked for their own benefit. Uh, the final truce they arrived at was to appoint Abdullah ibn Ubay to be the leader. And he was supposed to bring this war to an end. But when the Prophet ﷺ came and he received and he had all those followers, followers he realized, Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Ubay realized that he was not going to be appointed king after that. And he was a very evil person. He was known for so many bad things. But uh, when he saw the Prophet ﷺ coming, he felt very jealous. And he realized that was the end of his being appointed as a king. So he felt very bad about that. Now the Prophet ﷺ entered al Medina. People were inviting him to their houses. Please, O Messenger of Allah, come to my house. The Messenger ﷺ said, no, I will be the guest of Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar, we know that Banu Najjar, uh, you know, uh, the mother of Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, his mother is from Banu Najjar. Because his father, when he was going to Gaza in trade, he married from Medina. From Bani Najjar. So the mother of Abdul Muttalib is from Al Najjar. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I will go to them just to honor them because they are my family. I will honor them, Bani Najjar. So he went there. People were saying, Come to my house, even from Bani Najjar. Come to my house, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Leave, leave, leave the camel. It is commanded to sit and to come to one spot. So leave it. So the she camel was moving until it came to one area and it sat down. It sat down, the Prophet ﷺ looked around and he said, uh, which is the closest house to this area? Among the people of Bani Najjar, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said, Oh Messenger of Allah, it's my house. Please come to my house, my house is the nearest, so you will stay in my house. So the Messenger ﷺ agreed and he said, okay, go and prepare your house, and inshallah we will come and join you. So that was a great privilege Abu Ayyub al-Ansari got. And I'm sure that the people of Medina were so jealous of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari having such a great privilege. Everyone was wishing that he would be in his place. Now something I have to point out that I believe most of you have watched the movie The Message at Risala. And unfortunately many of the events there are inaccurate. Especially when it says shows about you know the she-camel comes and it rests in one place. And the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, this is the masjid. No, actually this is inaccurate. The camel or the she-camel where, where it sat down 
it was the area where the Prophet ﷺ chose the closest house and it was the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari who was extremely happy to receive the Messenger ﷺ in his house. His house was made of two stories, two levels. So when he, uh, he went and he prepared the house and he went to bring the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr, he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you come to my house. He wanted to give him the upper level or the upper story, the second story uh, or the second floor. But the Prophet ﷺ said to him, no, 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 it's better for us, it's better f- for us to be in the first level. It's easier for us and it's easier for the people who come to sit with me because people would be coming to sit with me, learn, and we, I would speak to people. So it would be very hard for them to go to the second floor every time. So I will remain in the, in the ground floor. He said, oh Messenger of Allah, I can't stay in a place on top of your head. I can't do that. He said, Oh, the Prophet ﷺ kindly you know, uh, convinced Abu uh, Ayyub al-Ansari, please you stay on the top and I will stay there. It's easier for me and for the people. That's better. So after that, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari agreed. So when it, when it was night time, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari would always make food and send it to the Prophet ﷺ. And you know, something very funny that shows us, and very beautiful, a beautiful aspect that shows how the Muslims really loved the Prophet ﷺ, how they respected him, how they revered him. That Abu Ayyub al-Ansari would say that I would walk only, you know, adjacent to the wall. When he was on top, he would just walk next to the wall, adjacent to the wall. He said, I won't walk, you know, around in the house because I was scared that I might, I might walk on a spot where the Prophet ﷺ would be directly under me. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine myself walking you know, on top of the head of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, I, I couldn't do that. You know, it was torture for him. It was very difficult for him to be on top and the Prophet you know, in the, in, in the uh, lower level or on the ground level. He couldn't do that. He couldn't live. He, could, he said, I couldn't go, I couldn't walk around the house. I was just walking adjacent to the wall. I didn't want the Prophet, the Prophet to be underneath. He said, I couldn't imagine myself doing that. And he said, one day we had a big jar where they used to uh, keep the water uh, made of poultry. Uh, so he said one day it fell and it broke and it has some water. And water means because, you know, the, uh, they didn't have proper, like, proper layers. They didn't have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the ceiling made of cement. No, it was made of what? It was made of the leaves of palm trees. That's all. So uh, if, wo- if some water was spilt on the top floor, it would go, it would sink down and filtrate to the uh, ground floor. So he said... The, the jar broke and water was spilt. So he said, Wallahi, we brought our own, the only blanket that we had. We started drying the ground with it out of fear that the Prophet ﷺ would be hurt even if it be by one drop of water. This is how much love they had for the Prophet ﷺ. This is how much respect they had for him. And today, and this is, this is the thing that made them follow his sunnah, word by word. Not like many Muslims today, they're not concerned even about the Prophet ﷺ. He doesn't mean anything. He's just part of history to them. So, love of the Prophet ﷺ is shown in our actions. Now, one day I said to a young, a young brother, he was making some of these funny hairstyles. He was following fashion and everything. He couldn't even tell that he was a Muslim. So I told him, we came to the point in our discussion where I said to him, do you love the Prophet ﷺ? He said, yes, I love him so much. I said, but I don't see any sign on you. He said, it's only in the heart. It's only in the heart. Iman is in the heart. Forget about the, out, the, the looks. It doesn't mean anything. I said, no. It means anything. What's in your heart is reflected on your looks. The inward manner perfect, is perfectly re- uh, reflected by the outward manner. This is a rule that is clear. Umar ibn Khattab says, in a beautiful statement which is authentic, he says that the dress code will not meet, the dress code, it means the dress code of a people or a person will not be the same as the dress code of another person or another people unless the hearts are the same. Imagine, unless the hearts are the same, you will not have the same clothes. This is a very important thing from a person who... Learned Islam from the Prophet 
So if we really love the Messenger وسلم, this would show on our actions, this would show on our looks, this would show on our words, this would show on so many things. If it doesn't show, that means there is a defect in our love for the Prophet وسلم. And one day uh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari made some food for the Prophet وسلم, or, uh, and he sent it down to him. But the food you know, had garlic. So the Messenger وسلم, didn't eat from it. So when Abu Ayyub al-Ansari took the plates back, he saw that the Prophet وسلم, didn't eat from it. He said, Oh Messenger of Allah, what did I do? Did I do anything wrong? He said, why? You didn't eat from my food. He said, no, it's not that. Imagine, he didn't want the Prophet ﷺ to be upset with him with anything. The Messenger ﷺ said, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night. He said, إِنِّي أُنَاجِي مَنْ لَا تُنَاجِي you know, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night. I'm all the time remembering Allah and supplicating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I don't want to, I, I can't eat this, you know, this, uh, this food which is garlic because it has this bad smell. So this was the reason. So we can see that the companions were always concerned about the Prophet وسلم, about his uh, welfare and about uh, how they treated him and how much he was pleased with them. Now, we have come to uh, the end, I can say, of the Meccan period and the end of the Hijrah. And from now on, we would see what happened in Medina, the Hijri uh, period or uh, the, or the Madani period, the, uh, the Madinian period has started in Medina and this is a new stage in the seerah, a new stage in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What we will do, we will stop here and maybe for next time inshallah we will take lessons, we will have a glimpse on the Meccan period. We will t- try to take the lessons from it. We'll try to see the lessons that we can take from everything the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did because as I said there are so many similarities between our state today and the state of the Meccan period. And the experiences the Prophet ﷺ had to go through during the Meccan period, there are many similarities. The Muslims were weak, the Muslims uh, uh, were persecuted, the Muslims were looked down upon, and the Muslims had to plan to become strong and victorious. How did the Prophet ﷺ plan all of this? How did he deal with different challenges? All of this, inshallah, we will try to shed some light on it so we can benefit from it and learn from it. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us benefit from the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and take his example as our role model. And uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us uh, be better Muslims. Until we meet next time, I leave you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us. So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. And the merriment of cheer, but our hearts will lose their tenderness. If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits wrong